Hello, everyone. My name is Eden Hailu. Thank you so much for joining World Learning's second webinar in our series, ELT Classroom Connections. Today's webinar, Do More With Less, Ideas for Making Learners More Active in Their Learning, is designed to help you discover strategies to make learners work more than we do as educators. Our wonderful speaker, Burak Aydin, will work with you to discover ways of decentering the teacher thereby making lessons more learner-centered and learner-managed. Please expect this session to be interactive and full of practical tools that will make you think, discuss, and plan for your next lessons. This webinar, as I mentioned, is presented by World Learning. For over 90 years, World Learning has offered an array of TESOL programming, including intensive customized training courses, leadership planning, professional development for teachers, and educational system strengthening. We believe that when teachers are better educated and better equipped, they are better positioned to motivate and empower their students in their language learning. World Learning is excited to offer this webinar series as an additional resource. As part of this webinar series, we are excited to introduce a digital badge system for participants. This badge is a symbol of accomplishment for those of you who have committed to strengthening your language education prof proficiency by participating in this webinar. It can be downloaded, printed on a certificate, or shared online. We included information about the badges in the webinar um, when we sent out that email, but as an additional reminder, you will need to submit a request through a short Google form to receive the badge. The link to the Google form will be posted in the WebEx chat at the end of the webinar. Within a week, we'll send an email with a PDF of the presentation slides, links to resources used in the presentation, information about the digital badges, and answers to some of the questions in the WebEx chat that were not addressed during the Q&A session. There will also be a link to our YouTube page where you can find an edited recording of this webinar. So please keep an eye out for that email. With that being said, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Burak Aydin. Burak is an instructor of English and a licensed teacher trainer for the SIT TESOL certificate course. He teaches in a tertiary level preparatory English program and is also involved in mentoring and supervising language teachers. In the field of, of teacher training, he has been conducting research, facilitating courses, and presenting at ELT conferences, in-house professional development events, and various educational institutions. So Barack, we're so excited to hear everything you have to say. Please take it away. Thank you so much, Eden, <clears throat> for this beautiful introduction. I'm really happy to be here and happy to see the crowd. And thank you for participating. It shows your dedication to teaching. Um, teaching for many teachers is a calling. So that's obviously the fact here right now. Thank you so much for coming. Um, today, we will do more with less as teachers, so you can see the message as twofold, uh, meaning that students will do more while teachers will do less with some strategic and effective activities and techniques. And uh, we're going to discuss how to relieve the teacher while giving a powerful learning opportunity to the students. So we will have, uh, hopefully, we will have a lot of discussions and the presentation will be insightful for you. So how are we going to do that? We will do, um, first of all, I will discuss the idea behind making learners more active. Why should we make learners more active? What's the idea behind it? And, and doing that, I will also mention 10 tools for doing more with less that will help us do this. So I promise you can take these tools to your classroom just tomorrow, and we can also discuss the things um, about the different platforms that you can use the tools like face-to-face -face setting or online setting or both. In the end, we will have a reflection part where we will um, um, do a little thinking, pairing, and sharing session, and then we will have a Q&A at the very end, just like Eden mentioned. Let's start. Let's take it away then. And um, first, as the first agenda uh, item, we will discuss the idea behind making learners more active. Um, the first idea here is just teaching, um, despite being a very rewarding job, is a calling for many of us. But it's also a little bit of a 
difficult job. So I want to start a little bit of a chat box activity for you to tell me if you think, just like me, teaching is a difficult job, why should it be so? Do you have any opinion? You can rein your ideas in the chat box very shortly. Tana says, since the teacher has to perform different roles, yes, overworking teachers, absolutely. It's interesting for me, yes. Teaching is a very interesting job. And if I says demanding, as it says tangible and intangible elements behind, yes. A lot of unseen work going on too. Time conceiving, yes. Keith, nice to see you. <laughs> In Africa, you have to do a lot of a lot of work as a teacher. I see it, Hamisu. Yes, thank you. Good to see you too. It's a skill to be practiced. Being a teacher, teaching students, it's really very good job. I completely hear you. I agree completely. Understanding students' different abilities and different intelligences, carrying out differentiated instruction, yes. It's not difficult, but you need to plan what you teach, yes. Yeah, and students come from varied backgrounds. Thank you so much. Um, so, yeah. One of them, one of the reasons our teachers are really busy individuals. There are a lot of unforeseen work going on, right, in, in um, uh, on a daily, day, daily basis. So we do lots and lots of things. So the things that you see on the screen right now, really, on a daily basis, we do them. We model, we speak, we teach, we try, we respond, mentor. Also, um, we act like a parent or at the same time, we speak like a professional. So teaching, we are really busy outside the class as well. So we need, it shows us that we need to use our energy and skills very effectively and strategically in the class. So it makes sense. And secondly, teachers make too many decisions on a regular basis. I took this from teachthought.com. You can see the resource credit of the right bottom corner. So it says a teacher makes 1500 decisions a day. Um, that's more than a brain surgeon does on a daily basis. Um, maybe you can identify with that in a, in a typical class, <clears throat> in a 45, 50 minute or 60 minute class, you find yourself making decisions, changing the activities, also um, changing the group dynamics very often. So it makes four decisions made every minute. It, isn't it too much? So yeah, uh, there's a lot of cognitive load in teaching as well. Also, another thing that makes teaching uh, a hectic job is teachers try to maintain cohesion and coherence in a class, which means you have to know your learners, maintain the classroom dynamics, know who works with who, create a classroom story in a long time, and uh, you have to do them and you have to keep it in mind. Sometimes you have, and very often you have multiple classrooms to be taught and you have 25, 30 students per class so you have to, sometimes you cannot even remember the names. So it's another cognitive load. So we need to decenter the teacher a little bit here. So decenter the teacher means that, it doesn't mean that you don't do anything, still you do the things, but strategically and effectively. So while doing that, um, actually you provide well-being for you because you have more time to make your decisions, more time to think about your students and what's going on in the classroom. And at the same time, you give your students maximized learning opportunities because the best learning style is when you put your mind and hand on an activity, just like learning a lot of other skills, just like driving, playing an instrument, and also learning a language too. If you can maintain them um, well-being and maximize learning opportunity by decentering the teacher, <clears throat> actually you provide quality of life in the classroom where every individual in the lesson can find a piece of learning, a piece of life for themselves, where they're active in one part of the lesson and they, they are totally engaged in the lesson. So that's why the 10 tools that I'm gonna mention today will help you um, hopefully for these three purposes. I wanna mention monkey management too. I, I'm not sure if you've ever heard that. It's generally um, resonated in business sector for managers. A uh, monkey means a duty to be done on your shoulder, right? And um, it's a work to be done. 
you either feed the monkey or the monkey starves on your shoulder. So if the monkey is starved on your shoulder, that means that you have a lot of things to be done, but you can't, you don't have time. And then you have a big gorilla on your shoulder. So uh, you can find the article it comes from. It's um, from William Onken from 1974 HBR article. You can scan the um, QR code on the very uh, on the right hand side, or you can see in the resource credit the name of the article is "Who's Got the Monkey," and it means that the managers assume lots and lots of work that their subordinates should do. And at the end of the day, managers are overwhelmed while subordinates can have fun time maybe. Um, it's not directly related to the English class, language class, but still it tells us a lot in the language class. Imagine yourself and think about your class today if you taught. A student asking you a question actually throws a monkey on their shoulder. So if it's a question that can also be answered by their peers rather than you, actually it shows that you assume a wrong monkey. You have to throw it back as a teacher, right? If not, you assume everything on your shoulder, a big gorilla on your shoulder, and when the class day ends, you feel yourself overwhelmed. That's the idea. So when you take it directly to the classroom, you can think about balancing work patterns. Because if it's a teacher-student relationship class, which is generally a traditional class, a lecture type, is somewhere teacher speaks um, uh, a lot of time and students have to listen and take notes and teacher feels really tired and students do not find really effective learning opportunities. So we need to balance that in order to give them the monkey so that monkeys jump on shoulder to shoulder rather than you having all on your shoulders. Like student student work pattern is something to be think, thought about like pair work, group work, which I'm gonna to mention today. Also student resource relationship, which we do not think very often. Uh, and it means that Students have to check the dictionary, check a website to discover language themselves on a piece of um, story. And um, there's something to be listened and then they try to discover the language coming up and arising rather than me telling them and announcing them today's topic. So I want also you to think about where is the monkey in the activities I'm gonna to mention today. All right, so in the second part, I'm going to mention my 10 tools and my 10 tools will be separated into 6 different segments. Some of the tools will fall into instruction, teaching vocabulary, grammar, listening, speaking and writing. And please take instruction, not all, only um, giving instructions for a task um, in a broader sense. It's generally your general instruction, general teaching style and yeah, uh, going on a daily basis. That's what we mean. Okay? And um, uh, some of them I will showcase and some of them I will stop and give you an opportunity to uh, give me your ideas on the chat box. We use our microphone sometimes, send it to the breakout rooms, and, but generally we'll be using chat box for this. If you're ready, let's start. For my general instruction, I exploit two things. One of them is TPS and body system in the class. I use it a lot and visuals too. And I think both of them work instead of me and students find a lot of learning in them. First of all, TPS stands for think, pair and share. And it's a motif in my classrooms to source information among individuals. I don't think students are tabula rasa, right? They know a lot of, a lot of things. They bring lots and lots of experience with them, uh, differences and variety just like you mentioned at the very beginning in the chat box. So they need to think alone, then pair with a partner, then share, so that you can have a lot of knowledge going on in the classroom. How does it work? So first of all, a student has some time to think over a reading conference, a comprehension question, a listening comprehension question, or any discussion activity, any discussion questions. I use it for a variety of tasks. So first of all, I give them opportunities to think, and then they pair with a partner and they think together. They exchange their notes and their thinking. Now they see each other's thinking, they see each other's mistakes, and then they get some relief and confidence in doing that. There's not only um, analytic part going on, but also there's a lot of effective part going on in this pair activity. If you wanna exploit it even more, which I do very often, I um, 
partner pairs this time. So fours now source each other. And then they bring their notes, they learn from each other, and they, there is a higher probability for students to learn from each other. If it's not enough, you can now pair fours, and then you have eight students discussing starting as ones and then becoming eight. So this is called pyramid discussion. I use it a lot in the classroom. That's where pair work uh, keeps on giving. <laughs> and um, at the end of this activity, how much does a teacher do? Literally zero. What you do is you ask the question, but students do all the job, all the exchange of ideas and thinking here, while teachers just monitor and see how pairs and groups work. If you wanna exploit it even further for a term and module, you can body students, like two students responsible for each other's learning. They have to answer each other's questions as much as possible. If they, if they have a common concern, they have to set it up and then ask the teacher. They have to decide together. If then one of them is absent in the class, the another one should know why. So this is the body system going on in the classroom where they pair all the time and share all the time. And after all this pairing, then um, as a share with the whole class, it works really well in my class. Now they have the confidence, a lot of knowledge uh, sourced, and I'm ready to hear from them. Another thing I keep exploiting in my classroom really positively is visuals, preferably from my life. So on the right side, you see me kissing my cat in a reverse position. Here, I use this um, picture to teach instead of me. So maybe you might wonder now what it can teach uh, students. It can teach the prediction language, like what is gonna happen in three seconds, do you think? So it's some guessing vocabulary or future tenses. They have to use will. Maybe the cat will attack me. Maybe nothing will happen. I think this will happen. I don't think this will happen. So, um, and, um, we create the stories and I ask them why they guess. And this one teaches a lot instead of me. I think visuals, I think vision is the best sense of learning. And it's also very memorable when you want to recycle prediction language. You can always refer to this picture. Do you remember me kissing my cat in a very strange position? Oh yeah, so we talked about prediction. Do you remember the sentences you created? And they utter, I tried it. They really utter, they remember visions and uh, visuals. So the one in the middle is a view from my balcony. We see a military base. So I use this picture to talk about some um, descriptions. So there is, there are some prepositions of place. Maybe you can use here. Um, description of the picture. You can uh, talk about the picture. Some present continuous tense can be practiced here. Present simple tense can be practiced here. And they're really curious. They are really engaged when they see the view from your balcony. Yeah. And the guy on the left is, um, I took his picture from an AI website. You can see in the image kind of the left bottom corner, this person does not exist.com. This is one of my favorite websites. Whenever you refresh the page, it gives you a different face. How do I use those people as they, these people do not exist. They are artificial intelligence created people. I use them uh, in the class as avatars. What I sense in the classroom, what I've seen over the years is that students do not like to talk about their lives. They don't wanna talk about themselves as much as they wanna talk about other people. So it's very easy to name this guy and talk about his age, where he's from, rather than them taking time to talk about their family, where they are from, they like it better. So I also use it as a writing activity too. Okay, this is you now. So please talk about yourselves on a piece of paper or talk to your partners. Pair, pyramid discussion, and share. You can use it anyway. They're very versatile. Um, I also use visuals at, for word associations when I teach vocabulary specifically. And let's work with you now. Uh, what I do is I give them some vocab items learned on a particular day, and I give them a picture not remotely connected to these vocab items. What I ask them to do is I want them to connect, like there are some rooms in, in, the, in this house, apparently you have the, you know, on the first floor, as you see, there's a bathroom, a bedroom, and on the right side, you have the baby's room. So on the ground floor, you have living room on the left side, kitchen in the middle, and the study on the right side. And I ask them, where do you feel yourself nervous? Please attach 
and there is not a set answer. Now I invite you to pick one of them. And just like the style you see in the bottom, it's like, I feel nervous in the living room because of this. I feel punctual in this room because I do this. I feel rejuvenated, refreshed here because of this. Let's go and try with the rejuvenated in the bathroom after a warm bath. Absolutely, it's a very good idea. Punctual in the kitchen. <laughs> Yeah, Gina bakes a lot, so you need to be timely, right? Baby's room. You feel rejuvenated. And the smile of the baby freshens me up. That's a beautiful idea. In the kitchen, happy to cook. Enjoy my drink while listening to a PD podcast. Yes. It's amazing, isn't it? I feel nervous when I'm in the kitchen. Feel rejuvenated after having bath. Makes sense. I feel nervous these days at my office because I have a lot of work to do. Thank you so much for these ideas. What do I do with this activity? When you attach them, it's always very memorable. Your episodic memory is active here because you remember visions very easily. Um, I tried asking rejuvenated a week later to the students, hey, do you remember which one, which room of the house you connected rejuvenated to? They remember. It's very interesting. And they retain knowledge for a long time. Thank you for joining me in this activity. <laughs> Okay, so specifically for vocab teaching, I use two things that um, that helps me do more with less. So students have more opportunities to work while as a teacher, I use my time and energy very strategically. So mingle, how does it work? I use mingle as voc with the vocabulary cards. Uh, imagine me teaching a set of vocabulary, just like nervous, rejuvenated, and the other one. And I give them on the cards to all the pairs. I pair students and mingle starts as a way that student A has rejuvenated and student B has nervous and the other students has other vocab items learned today. And student A now has to talk about his vocab items so that B needs to guess. It's just like a taboo game, right? You need to talk about it. Or student A can guess about student B's card so that student B can answer some yes, no questions. So is it a good feeling? No. Is it a bad feeling? Yes. So are you stressed when you feel that? Yes. Like, are you nervous? Yes. Kind of thing. So please choose your way, however you want to use it. And it becomes eternal mingle. And when I ask students to change their cards this time and find somebody else to talk about their cards. Now they have another pair and another card each time they change their pair. So it's eternal. It never stops uh, un unless you say stop. So as a teacher, how much do I do? Just I prepare some cards for them. And sometimes I ask them to prepare the cards. I give them the cards. They write nervous, rejuvenated, and then they start, they stand up and start mingling in the classroom. It helps me a lot, helps them a lot. And uh, students do, do students have another chance to practice their vocabulary learning? It's a very good practice, maybe rather than um, filling in the blanks, which is also a very good activity. Here, they have to move, they have to change the cards every time they change somebody and change the card. So this is um, very helpful in my class. It makes students work more than I do. Time on task is uh, another principle they try to increase in the class. It's like, imagine me um, teaching clothes vocabulary on a, on a specific class, and I teach them 16 vocab items about clothes and doing practice and not a lot of stuff. So I want to make sure they will retain the knowledge and internalize these vocab items by increasing their time on this task. What I just do as a teacher is just to cue them so that they have to play with these vocab items again and again. Let me show you how it works. I use some very interesting techniques for them to see these vocab items again and again. The first one is categorizing. I always invite students to categorize a set of vocabulary into two or three any way they like. And then generally go like this, okay, now, that you learn these vocab items, you feel yourself really powerful, and let's go categorize them into three. What do they need to do? They need to study these vocab items again. So you can categorize them as top, bottom, footwear, season-wise. You can go, I don't know, casual, 
smart, smart, casual, any way you like, you can go. Let's um, try one with you. I increased time on task with categorize, but this time I will use another technique. I want you to sort the ones you would wear for a picnic. Please go to the chat and write your ideas. Now I gave you a second chance to study these vocab items. T-shirt, jeans, boots. Makes sense. T-shirt, trainers, tracksuit. Yes. Jeans, T-shirts and shoes. Short socks and hats. Hat and jeans. Wow. That's great. So it depends on the season as well. Generally you go in spring, right? T-shirt, jeans, shorts, trainer, socks, bag. Yeah, absolutely. So here I gave you another chance and another opportunity. We work on the vocabulary item. As a teacher, what did I do? Just cued you in. I said, sort them, categorize them. You have to work with your partners. Maybe it's a better idea. That's what I do in the class. Let's do another thing. Connect and compare is another thing. You can compare jeans and trousers. You can compare jumper and hat. I don't know, but you can also connect or disconnect. Um, so, and here we go. Please go to the chat and which two you wouldn't wear together. Which two clothes here you would not wear together. Now you have to work on these items again. Boots and dress. Yes, it will be very interesting. Shorts and coats. Okay. Shorts and gloves. Tracksuit and a belt. It would be very interesting, right? Gloves and shorts. Absolutely. Tracksuit and jumper. I would not wear shorts and gloves together. Okay. Absolutely. So I gave you third round to work on these vocab items without me taking time to repeat what they mean. You have to work them on them, right? What I also do, I make them order. And I, uh, we don't, we won't do it in the chat box, but if you have time, you can. Um, like order them in a way that the, the most expensive, the least, right? Order them in a way that you have the most, you have the least. Yeah. And then they have to work on them again and again. That's what I do. So I can categorize, sort, connect, compare, or order this uh, set of uh, vocab items. Every time I teach a vocabulary items as a list in the books, generally we have them as a list. It's not really, really engaging. And I increase the time on task with these four strategies. Let's come to the grammar. Grammar, um, as I observe many teachers, um, grammar as I see it is a very, um, time consuming and energy consuming work for teachers. That's what I do. So I do three things uh, all the time. I increase consciousness in the, cl in the class before I start teaching grammar. That's what I do, consciousness raising. It's before. Collaborative dialogue is during activity for me um, while teaching grammar. And digestion time is a post activity. So you can take them as pre, during, post, grammar teaching activities. Let me show you how it works. Here, I throw the monkeys to the shoulders of students as much as possible, because as I see it, students have more fun and learn better when they discover grammar in a context. And by me te testing them again and again, I just test them. I just ask them very good questions. That's what I do. And let me show you how consciousness raising works first. So consciousness raising generally works with either a story, with a piece of listening or a classroom instance. Like sometimes I act like I'm falling in the classroom and I try to ask them a question in perfect tense. And I say, what has just happened to me, right? I sometimes show my big belly, which I don't have, but so I will show my belly and say, hey, what do you think have I just eaten? And then they go, hmm. Let me think about it. What have I been doing as I'm sweating right now? It's a classroom instance. If you, if you want to change the style and modality, like put it on a piece of paper and ask them to find the upcoming vocab items or grammar items. Let's work with you. I invite you all to read this dialogue and find four different words related to prediction, four different words related to prediction and put it in the chat, please. I can repeat the question. Yes. So about prediction, I invite you to find four different vocabulary items, four different words. They are one word, but they're different about prediction and guessing. 
Yes, certainly is one of them. Thank you, Tom. Perhaps is one of them. Remember, th this should be one word items. Yeah, this just a word. Certainly, maybe, perhaps, and maybe one more. Who knows is also good, but um, it should be one word. Definitely, absolutely. Here we go. So perhaps, maybe, definitely, certainly. Also, you have them again going on in the later later parts. Now, I also ask students, I will not do it with you, but you can in the classroom. I ask students to categorize them into two. So one category is perhaps and maybe, and one category is definitely and certainly. So how sure and unsure you are, you can categorize them into two. So this consciousness raising is about grammar and vocab teaching. And here, what I do is I use a very good text, story, or classroom instance. And I ask students to find the upcoming vocab item. Obviously, in this situation, I'm going to teach them these four vocab items. But first, I give them the mic and ask the pairs and then also so to find these different vocab items themselves and say, uh-huh. So we're going to learn them now. So get the sense of it, the meaning of it at the very beginning. So after my consciousness raising, my teaching continues with collaborative dialogue. Collaborative dialogue, as Meryl Swain put it, is a knowledge building dialogue, a dialogue that constructs linguistic knowledge. What does it mean? Very basically, it is students talking about form rather than exchanging meanings. So they sit down, they talk about the formulas and forms of language together to find it out, find the intrinsic workings of grammar. So how does it work? Now I will give you another grammar topic of um, from another book, it's just imagine me teaching possessive adjectives and apostrophes. I give this page, generally you have a grammar page at the back of the book very often, and I invite pairs or bodies, if I have a body system in the class, to read them through and label these lines in accordance with how much they think they know about them. Like I ask them to put a tick if they believe I becomes my is pretty easy because they, the first thing they learn is my name is. So they came across my a lot more than there, right? And also, I also invite them to put a question mark if they see something very strange and there is some cognitive dissonance going on. What's going on kind of thing. For example, it becomes it's um and then there's no apostrophe with it so it's very strange maybe you want to ask the teacher a question here i also ask them to put an exclamation mark if they think something is very crucial to be learned like parents with apostrophe s or s apostrophe it makes a huge difference and shows if it's singular or plural right and then after p um, pairs work on it like in a collaborative dialogue now I'm the teacher taking their questions or I create pyramid discussion so that they can maybe answer each other's question marks, right? And then they can exchange their ideas about the exclamation marks. So they can exchange if they have the common ticks. And then uh, after I give them another round of discussion and sourcing opportunity, I invite them to ask them their questions. So how much does a student teacher do here? Not much, not as much as students do. And students have to think a lot about what's going to come up, think a lot about their gaps in their knowledge, and also think very seriously about what to ask the teacher. Maybe they don't have to, maybe their peer knows better. Remember the monkeys. So you can throw the monkey to your peers rather than the teacher. And they learn really effectively this way. It works in my class. Try in your class. If it if it works in your class, I will be really happy. Digestion time is my post grammar activity. It's a reflection time. You can also call. I call it digestion times. Maybe you will not see it in the literature. Uh, digestion. Why digestion? Because I sometimes find myself during grammar teaching feeding students a lot. But when you eat, you need some time to digest what you know what you eat. So just like that, you have to stop and think about what just happened. And then I ask them in white bodies and pairs or in the primitive discussions, fours and eights to tell each other what they have learned and what still puzzles them and then show each other their notes because some students keep really good, take really good notes. So they may, maybe might like to share and some crucial points in the book too. ask each other their questions before they ask me. So it works better in my class. 
Okay, listening. Now we will get a little bit active here. Um, listening, I use a clap and check system to check um, listening comprehension questions generally. Because um, uh, starting teaching, I found myself very struggling, struggling very much while giving the answers and satisfying students in terms of the answers. Um, but I could not do much as clap and check could, right? And um, clap and check works um, to teach listening as much as test listening, because I observe a lot of classes and I see some teachers may tend to test listening rather than teach listening, but clap and check teaches listening on the spot. How does it work? First of all, we do a listening activity, which we will do with you together. Now, please don't use the chat box right now. Just answer these questions alone. Apparently you're alone now. Um, and just answer them true or false and think think why, okay? And in the second round, what we're gonna do is we will stop at where the answer for question one comes, where the answer for question two comes and three comes so that we will see how it works, how you correct your own answers. But for the first round, again, I just want you to enjoy this listening and answer these true or false questions. And I give you 20 silent seconds for you to, for this pre-listening activity, please check the questions. Okay, I guess you're ready. Apparently it's about studying and let's see what's going on. Please answer these questions. Please don't use the chat box right now. Good morning. <laughs> Today, I'm going to talk about how to study. <laughs> Now, you probably think you know all about that, right? Yes. <laughs> You've been studying for years. And I expect some of you are fantastic at studying, really organized and good at concentrating. But there's always room for improvement. And your exams aren't far away. So these tips are for all of you. Right, so what's the best way to study? First of all, it's a good idea to have some kind of plan or timetable. This could be for the week or a longer revision timetable for an exam from one month to six months. <gasps> yes, if you're studying for an important exam, it's important to think long term. Draw up a timetable, but revise it often. If it's not going to plan, you may have to rethink it. Next, think about your environment. Make sure the place where you're going to study is comfortable with enough light, air, etc. Not too hot, not too cold. Make sure there are no distracting noises around, such as television. If you think you concentrate better listening to music, Experiment and see if it's really true. Some people really do seem to work better with music in the background, especially classical music. Okay, I guess it's enough. So imagine me doing this in the classroom with this pre-listening activity where I give students some time to review the questions and then some lonely work, like alone work so that they can uh, answer these questions. Now they are ready. Now I want to check the answers. Um, there might be some conflicts here. I need to explain. I need to find some certain spots where to give the answers. I think it's very time consuming and um, energy consuming. What I do is I make the listening again very simply and I ask students to clap when they hear the answer for the first one. So apparently we cannot do it now. I'm going to um, model the first one for you so that you can see how it works. And then um, we'll see how it also works in the second one and the third one. I will use different strategies and also you'll be involved in the third one, okay? So I will run it again and I will show you how it works. But for many people. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Today, I'm going to talk about how to study. <laughs> Now, you probably think you know all about that, right? Yes. <laughs> You've been studying for years. 
and I expect some of you are fantastic at studying, really organised and good at concentrating, but there's always room for improvement, and your exams aren't far away. So these tips are... And I go this one. So your exams aren't far away. On the spot, I found the answer as a student. If you call me as a student right now and I say, yeah, it's true. Why? Because on the spot, I heard your exams aren't far away. Now I have a reference point in the class. The first clapper will answer. And then um, so that the students take a chance to prove what's true and what's false instead of me taking time and showing so it's more satisfying isn't it now for the second one i will use eden eden are you ready <laughs> so that we will show you how yeah so it will show i we will show you how it works in real class eden will be my student uh, and then she will clap unmuting so it will also show you that you can use it in an online setting where everybody can unmute and clap but if it's really chaotic, it doesn't work. Uh, we will work in another way in the third one, the chat box. Eden, ready for the second one? Let's go. For all of you. Right, so what's the best way to study? Well, first of all, it's a good idea to have some kind of plan or timetable. This could be for the week or a longer revision timetable for an exam from one month to six months. <gasps> yes, <laughs> if you're... Great, Eden. I saw you clapping. What's your answer? Well, I think the answer is false uh, because I heard the teacher say one month to six months, not one to six weeks. Incredible. So I would also now throw the monkey to the students back after Eden gives this answer saying that, do you agree? And they'll say, yeah, did you hear the same thing? Yes, because we are on the spot. Thank you, Eden, for joining me. Now I will ask everyone to type in the chat, hey, when they hear the answer for the third one. I guess you guys are ready, let's go. Please type, hey, when you hear. If you're studying for an important exam, it's important to think long-term. Draw up a timetable, but revise it often. If it's not going to plan, you may have to rethink it. Next, think about your environment. Make sure the place where you're going to study is comfortable with enough light, air, etc. Not too hot, not too cold. Make sure there are no distracting noises around, such as television. If you think you concentrate better listening to music, experiment and see wow i see lots of haze what i would do in an un in a class where there's an unmuting opportunity is for the first writer of hay which is david i would invite david to say why okay it would go this way in a real class they can say hey they can finger snap they can clap or now i can ask you what you heard and if it's true or false, now we can follow up in the chat box. So it is apparently false because it's uh, he she says experiment. Maybe it might work for your case. Absolutely. Thank you for joining me here. And you said false. And now I can ask you why. And this discussion can go if there is not an unmuting opportunity. We try to show you the face to face opportunity, chat box opportunity, and how it works in a real face to face class. It works perfectly. Okay, thank you for joining me. And speaking, for speaking now, I use disappearing dialogue to teach um, dialogues instead of me. Because generally, um, if, if you might notice, we generally teach them dialogues, like giving directions, like visiting doctor, you know, doctor-patient dialogue. So generally, we teach them functional dialogues in our books as a speaking activity. And uh, there's a very simple tool that I keep in, keep using in the class and make students internalize themselves is a disappearing dialogue activity. I basically give them the dialogue like this. And then um, let's call this dialogue about rejoinders, which is about reactive language that you might see in bold here. Great. 
wow, congratulations, yeah, sure, kind of thing. And you ask your students um, to see the function of this dialogue, which is about two colleagues talking about their work. Please keep this theme going on and please make sure you learn rejoinders here. First, I give pairs opportunity to do this dialogue but watching on the screen, right? I project it on the screen and then they do it. After a while, I do this and I ask them to keep practicing by filling the blanks, by improvising. You have to improvise. Remember, you have to keep the function going and you have to add the rejoinders at a certain spot. And then another round, okay? And then I completely delete it and I invite them, two of them, to do the dialogue role play. Uh, so what I do here is they um, approach the target with small steps and I don't teach much as much as the dialogue itself does. The only thing you need is um, a couple of slides where some lines are missing. Yeah. Now uh, I will um, ask Eden to find me two teachers <laughs> among the crowd to practice it so that the dialogue will disappear in two turns, as you saw, and we'll ask, we will unmute two participants right now, and we will see how they keep the function going. Okay. Great. So Eden, if you would like you to participate in this activity, thank you, Barack, uh, please use the hand raise function. It's a button that should be at the bottom of your screen. If you are interested, I will unmute you and you will also be able to turn on your camera if you would like. So if you are interested, we just need two, two people to raise their hands. All right, I'm seeing one. Let me unmute. Okay, Ansari Shama, you should be able to unmute yourself and um, participate. Do we have one other volunteer? All Who right. is Dana? Thank you so much, yes. Alpha Jalo. Uh, yes. Okay, you may now unmute yourself. Uh, okay, I am awesome. A, right? You will be A, yes. And okay. uh, Alpha or Alpha, my apologies uh, for any mispronunciation, but you will be B. Okay. Hey, how is it going? Great. <laughs> Just got promoted in the company. I never saw it coming. Wow, such an accomplishment. Congratulations. Thank you. How are you doing? Not bad. Just arranging an online discussion meeting for the bo bosses. It has been tiring. You know, all the details and stuff. Tell me about it. Pain in the neck, meals after meals, call after calls. Let me about, uh, tell me about it. Pain in the neck, meals after meals, calls after calls. Yeah, let's forget about it. A drink together, available? Sure, let's do it. Thank you so much. Another round now. Please do it again. Hey, how is it going? Great. I just got promoted in the company. I never saw it coming. Not bad. Just arranging an online discussion meeting for the bosses. It has been tiring. You know, all the details and stuff. So I'm sorry, you have to fill the gap, like A is missing, you see? You have to find the sentence to keep the conversation going, okay? That's the point. Okay. Would you like to try again? I'm sorry, let's start again. Sorry to interrupt, but are we like supposed to learn it by heart? So the students are supposed to learn it by heart and they're, they're supposed to fill in the dialogue. Is that that's it? That, that's right, absolutely. Okay. So that's that's the idea, you have to improvise, you have to find something and add something there to keep the conversation going. It's sometimes very funny, 
for the most time, right? And then um, you have to do it again and again. Like, hi, how is it going? Great, just got promoted in the company. Never saw coming. You say, wow, and then you don't, don't remember much. And then beat continues. Thank you. How are you doing? Because in the next round, you okay. miss a lot of lines. So you have to do it again and again and again. Yeah, that's, so it's that's okay if, if we fill with our own words or even improvise. That's the point. That's the point. Absolutely. Thank you for joining me in this discussion. And Ansari and Alpha, thank you for doing it for one, a couple of rounds. So I, I guess the crowd, the audience today could understand what's going on. So um, what I do is also you know, in our books, we have some functions so that you can shadow some of the lines and I give pairs opportunities to find them out. If they don't remember, again, you have to improvise, you have to find natural language that keeps the conversation going. That's what I do with disappearing dialogue. Yes, absolutely. Yes, the dialogue keeps disappearing, absolutely. And finally, for writing, what I use is, uh, I use writing as a process to give students more opportunities to work on a piece of writing rather than me checking everything in their paper after first draft. I give them multiple draft opportunities, um, uh, you know, um, an opportunity to check each other and do more work than I do. So um, I'm generally inspired inspired by the idea of Anne Rames uh, from her book from 1983. You will see in the references later, maybe it's very small on the right corner, is that generally writing as a process goes this way as the, um, um, the techniques on the left that you see. First, everybody writes the first draft. There is the writer's process, any, any piece of writing. And then there's a peer check. There's another draft, another peer check. Then teacher receives a refined, a distilled work after multiple checks. And according to N. Rames, any um, piece of writing has nine elements in it, as you see in this diagram. We have syntax embedded in it, grammar, mechanics, organization, word choice, purpose, audience, writer's process and content. So for sure, when you write a piece of writing, you need a purpose to write it, right? If you write an email, it's about a complaint. If you write a paragraph, it's about a review, right? To review somewhere, there's a purpose in it, must be a purpose in it. You need an audience. When you write an email, you write an email to somebody. There should be an addressee, yeah? And there needs to be a writer's process where you put your pen on the paper and you put your head down to write your own work um, alone. Yeah, but here, my point is how we can do this peer check part. Peer check part is what makes writing a process where you refine the drafts so that teacher has a better work in the end. It takes time, but it's really helpful in my classes. I dedicate its time because I keep students think about their own writing again and again by seeing different styles while doing their peer check. And generally, from this all nine, now we have six elements left to be checked, right? What can, what can a peer check? I always think about it after knowing my learners. Generally, what I see is they can check each other's content and give feedback to each other because it's not really form oriented. They don't have to know much um, um, for form as much as for um, about meaning. So they need, they need to check each other if the ideas are relevant, if it's original, if there's some logic going on. They can check also, from my experience, I see, they can check each other's syntax, their sentence structures. If there is some missing auxiliary verb, they can tell each other very openly. And I also teach them the diplomatic constructive language before doing this, by the way. Organization, they check each other. For example, one of them, they, they write an email, right? And then they can easily check each other's emails. If there's certain paragraphs, if there's a starter, there's an opener, and there's um, some good line of thought. And if there's good organization, if there's a topic written, and if you say warm regards and your name in the end. Word choice, they also can check each other's word choice, um, as I see. From my experience is that hey you can use different words you repeat yourself a lot you can add relevant words 
kind of thing. What as a teacher I do, I check grammar and mechanics because it is very form oriented. Um, it's not really fun for peer check, so I can do it at home. Now I have a better work in my hand, right? I have two drafts or three drafts. They have been involved and I'm ready. So I just invite you to think about it. Um, you can always see these nine elements if you check N. Rames book, or you can take a you know, screenshot right now if you want to keep it and think about it right now. Uh, this is how it works in the classroom. So thank you for listening to me for all these ideas. Now what we're going to do, we're going to do a little reflection time in a TPS mode. If you remember, think, pair, share. Now you see everything, all the tools we talked about today on the right side and some guiding questions to ignite your thinking on the left side. What we want you to do is think about the first question. And then if you have time, you might think about the second question. But the first question is our paramount question. And think about TPS, visuals, and all the other tools, try to remember them. And we will give you tea time now, think part. We invite everybody now to think about them and think about the first question or the second question by making your notes for two minutes. Then we will pair you in the breakout rooms and we will share here in the chat box later. Now, please enjoy your two silent minutes to see the guiding questions and the tools. Okay, so I think individual thinking time is now over. We invite you to take a screenshot or follow Eden's share in the chat box so that you can keep these questions and tools at your possession because we will now guide you to the breakout rooms for seven minutes, uh, preferably threes. And there you will discuss these guiding questions, preferably the first one and if time the second one. Seven minutes is not too long, please remember that. So please have your conversation very effectively and go to the point. I know breaking dice sometimes takes time. Uh, so thank you so much for pasting them in the chat, Eden. Now I give it to you to create the breakout rooms and it's great to have you back again. Thank you so much. I hope you had a great opportunity to exchange your ideas about, especially the question number one. Uh, now we will do, we did T, we did P, and then now it's time to share. I think you now feel confident. You saw each other thinking. Now we will use the chat box for that. Please go to the chat box for question number one. I'm writing question number one to separate them. For question number one, please write your answers to the chat. So which tool or tools do you think will work well in your classroom? Because they will be recorded here. We will send to the chat box later, hopefully. So that maybe you can have it. Yeah, please write the name and say mingle because of this. I would use time on task because I teach a lot of vocabulary in my classroom. Writing because we have a lot of writing time in our syllabus, that kind of thing. And please write why. How would it work in your class? Mingle for gathering more ideas. Mm -hmm. Such a great sourcing opportunity, yeah, Kamayani. And visuals to expand vocabulary, yes. Try word associations, it works perfectly. I'll use time on task that will be challenging for my students. Okay, it will be very creative too, you know. I can use the tools for TPS, gives my students a chance to share their experiences, thoughts of any subject that has been discussed in class. Thank you, Sarah. I agree with you. Whoever wrote clap and check would be fun. It will allow them to identify the evidence to support their answers. Absolutely. It makes listening such an evidence oriented activity. And remember, it's teaching listening, not only testing it. TPS is just great to generate some ideas beforehand. Visuals have so much power and mingle breaks the ice. Absolutely. Mingle also makes a lot of warm up activities. Thank you, Octai. Sahara says visuals gives them opportunity to create stories, use vocabulary they know, or learn, learn new vocabulary. Yes, and they are very memorable, I think. Tom said consciousness raising in grammar, lay the context, pre teach, learn key vocabulary as a lead in. Mm -hmm. Nana said writing is a process because it helps 
with their writing of essays, completely hear you, watching video after they will learn vocabulary and new name, okay? Disappearing dialogue will be challenging for the students. Mm -hmm. Maybe, um, um, I'm not sure if I pronounce your, your name correctly. This is like Takulani, I will call you. Um, the disappearing dialogue, maybe you can raise the time for the first dialogue, which is full, so that they will have a lot of opportunities to internalize. Then you can delete some lines very later, you know. Disappearing dialogue, we can use it with vocab, new language, we can hide them, students can concentrate and find them. And it, you know, it naturalized the dialogue as well, Gulbarchin, right? They have to improvise, find what's missing themselves. Consciousness raising paves the way for a more effective mingle to break the ice. Thank you. Clap and check. Adapted since my classes are online. Mm -hmm. So Sahara, they can write haze, stop, hello, kind of things in the chat box if you like. Speaking, disappearing dialogue, stimulate them in thinking. And yeah, they fell. Mm -hmm. Categorize items. Mm -hmm. You mean time on task? Thank you so much. Now, quest question number two. If you have any opinions to record your opinions and for me to recognize your ideas, you can go ahead and write them to the chat. Do you have another idea or tool that you keep using in your class to do more with less, to give students more autonomy and for teachers more strategic thinking, energy saving? Ah, poster is a collaborative work. Completely agree give students a lot of chance to work, right? And it's very multimodal. Gather a walk, mm -hmm. brain breaks like energizing games, scavenger hub, yes, I like it too. Group work for speaking, voiceless videos, I also like it, maybe it's, because voiceless videos can be taken from any language you like. That's also another advantage. Cheryl says the wheel, do you mean the wheel of fortune? So that you can find some topics you know, some word items, vocabulary items. Thank you so much for your ideas. So we will send these ideas to you back, hopefully. So these are the references uh, for Endrame's book. You can see the references part, techniques in teaching writing. You can learn more about process writing, although it's a very old book. It's still very, very referential. Uh, influential and Mel Swain's idea of output hypothesis you might see in EFL literature very often so the social cultural theory as well you can think about collaborative dialogue there and image and resource credits you will see where I took my ideas to guide the images and now a Q&A session Eden over to you Hello, everyone. Thank you, Barak, for such a great session. And thank you to everyone for, you know, engaging in the chat and the breakout rooms and for all the activities. So if you have any questions relevant to Barak's presentation, can you please leave that in the chat? And Barak will get to as many as he can. We have a question here. How can we facilitate the students' modalities? Do you have any suggestions? Oh yeah, so yeah, we see lots and lots of modalities apart from students' characters, intelligences. If they are right brain person or a left brain person, I always keep thinking about these varieties in the classroom. And I find myself uh, not sufficient to address them all in one particular class. What I do is I have lots of cards in my pocket which means I have lots of differences, like one lesson goes with complete visuals, one lesson with silent videos for visual learners, for auditory learners, clap and check would be incredible, wouldn't it? So, and um, for kinesthetic learners, Mingle will work a lot, um, apparently. For tactile learners, you might have a leading activity where you have some authentic materials, some realias. So I bring to the classroom and, you know, um, I try to address them all because I don't only confine students to modalities. To me, vision is the best sense of learning. That's what I see in my learning. Um, but um, also I don't, uh, um, I don't undermine the other learning ideas, other learning styles uh, and characters. So what I do is I spend a lot of time profiling my class learning as much as possible about my learners. I see them 
Uh, it's just like I saw in a book, I remember, Teach Like a Pirate. I don't remember the authors generally. Here, uh, the author says that don't be a lifeguard to the swimmers in the classroom. Be the swimmer yourself. Swim together. So I'm always among them. I'm not sage on the stage. So I always go and tap on the shoulder, say, hey, are you okay today? Because I know you don't learn it that way. Um, you don't like formulas, you know. So I talk to them very often. Uh, yeah, I do my best to address them. How um, they will learn a particular way, but it's so hard to manage it in one single class, I think. Thank you for that answer. And thank you for the question in the chat. Uh, we have just about two more minutes before we wrap up and give the, the closing uh, notes. But there was a question further up in the chat about how to use these activities for reading practice. Do you have any tips on that? Yes, yeah, a great point. I was expecting that. So in, in my uh, categorization, you didn't see reading. I have my ideas about reading, but I see this presentation as a working document. So next time I will add some uh, ideas about reading. One thing I like, for example, as it uh, happens now, um, is that I give stu situ students an opportunity to write their own questions. So ask each other. I give them different modalities here. It's like true, false. It might be, it might be about a comprehension question. You can ask about numbers and names. So I'm on my way. So next time I present it, I will add this in it. So it's going to be my 11th tool, I guess, <laughs> apart from the other ones. Yeah. We look forward <laughs> to seeing that. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for joining. We hope you enjoyed the second webinar in our four part ELT classroom connections webinar series. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, within one week, we'll send an email with a PDF of the presentation slides, links to the resources used in the presentation, information about the digital badges, answers to any questions that we didn't get to in this Q&A session, and a link to our YouTube page and our Facebook page where you can find an edited recording of this webinar and more information about our programming. We will have a third webinar in two to three months, so please keep an eye out for any emails on that. And yeah, thank you again to Barack for all your insights and goodbye everyone. We hope to see you at the next webinar. Thank you all and thank you Eden and Gina. Thank you so much.